Well, I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Lord uh, Minganish. Uh, how are you, Lord Minganish? I am well, thank you, Alistair. Yes, how are you? I am good, thank you. Thank you so much for your good time. Good to be here. Great. Now, today we're going to talk about uh, the unification of the Land Court and Lands Tribunal. Uh, and I thought as a good uh, starting place, uh, it might be nice if you have time to give us an outline, please, of your route to becoming a judge and a chairman of the Land Court and president of the Lands Tribunal, please. Well, uh, I've been various things in the course of my legal career. At uh, various times, I've been a, a solicitor, an advocate, a sheriff, uh, and I was very happy as a sheriff, laterally based at uh, Kirkcaldy, when one day up popped uh, an all-sheriff's email asking for anyone uh, who might be interested in a secondment to the land court. Now, I come from a crofting background. I know about the land court. I was brought up with the land court. Uh, so I thought immediately, uh, you know, that's that's for me. Um, so I responded saying, yeah, I'm interested. Um, didn't even um, take the time or have the courtesy to run it past my sheriff principal, but he subsequently turned out to be very supportive of the idea. I got the secondment supposedly for 12 months as um, deputy chairman of the land court. Nothing to do with the lands tribunal at that stage. Uh, uh, but you know what happens with secondments, they tend to be <laughs> extended. And after about three years, um, it became apparent that the land court didn't really need a full-time deputy chairman. Uh, so then there was a number of years when I was, the land court had first call on my time. I was based at the land court, uh, but when the land court didn't need me, I sat as a sheriff uh, at Edinburgh then. Uh, and that was the case until October 2014, when Lord McGee, who had been the chairman of the land court and the president of the lands tribunal, uh, retired. Uh, and the post, this is quite significant, actually, the post of um, chairman of the land court was advertised. And, and in small print, it said, um, the chairman of the land court is normally also appointed to be the president of the Lands Tribunal. But the presidency of the Lands Tribunal is in the gift um, not of uh, the Judicial Appointments Board and the Scottish Government, uh, but in the gift of the Lord President of the day. Um, now, happily for me, it was Lord President Gill at that point, and, and he was happy enough to um, accept me as the president of the Lands Tribunal, as well as the chairman of the Land Court. Uh, so that, of course, was on a, on a full-time basis then, and um, I've been full-time since uh, October 2014 uh, and have enjoyed it very much indeed. Well, well Lord Mignes, thank you so much. Now, um, we have a, a wide-ranging audience with Hay Legal, and some will be very aware of the work that the, the, the bodies that you preside over do, but could you, for the uninitiated, please provide a brief outline of what each of, of the bodies currently does? The Land Court uh, has, it, it's easier to uh, define, if you like, the um, jurisdiction of the Land Court because it, it's, it's always been and continues to be uh, pretty tightly associated uh, to um, agricultural land. Um, you know, we're talking about crofting in the north of Scotland, tenant farm farming in the rest of Scotland. Uh, it's acquired an environmental fringe in recent years. We Hear appeals from uh, penalties imposed by SIPA, uh, but you know very very much identified with the agricultural sector uh, in Scotland still, despite the name. You know the Land Court would suggest a, a very wide jurisdiction. Um, paradoxically, the the Lands Tribunal has a wider range of jurisdictions, but much more disparate. So it's difficult to identify a, a central theme which uh, unifies uh, them. But things like Compensation for land compulsorily acquired if a local authority or whoever acquire land for a road or a school or whatever, uh, and compensation can't be agreed between the parties, uh, we resolve that sort of thing. Variation of title conditions. If a title to your property contains a condition um, you think is unreasonable or outdated or is preventing reasonable development, um, um, but perhaps your neighbours are objecting, uh, that comes to us as well. Uh, disputes arising from the land register, um, uh, they come uh, our way too. 
um, a host of smaller jurisdictions under the Electricity Act and, and more recently, actually, uh, under the uh, newish uh, electronic tele um, telecom um, code, telecommunications code, I should say, uh, where uh, telecom operators want to cite masts um, throughout the country and there's a dispute about the terms. Um, that's given us quite a significant new jurisdiction, in fact. So uh, the Lands Tribunal has a wider range of things, which is less easy to characterize as having any kind of central unifying theme. But between them, you know, put them both together, as this proposal does, uh, and you have, uh, you know, a land court, which, if you like, lives up to the name, because it will have a, a very wide uh, jurisdiction over uh, land issues. It's important to realize that both the court and the tribunal are creatures of statute. So uh, we only have the jurisdictions were given by statute and anything that falls uh, out with that um, still goes to the ordinary courts, the sheriff court or, or the court of session. And I'm hoping that as part of this proposal, when um, we get to the stage where a, a bill is being written, uh, that that jurisdiction is slightly extended at least. At the moment, for instance, although we can deal with title conditions, the Lands Tribunal can't determine the validity of a servitude or its effect. And it would be very useful to have that additional jurisdiction as well. Uh, but the jurisdictions uh, we have and the jurisdiction the unified body will have will be entire, are and will be entirely statutory. Right. So, so uh, the proposal to unify the bodies was one that, that you um, yourself made. And could you just outline what you see as being the, the key benefits of, of, of doing so, please? Well, well, the starting point is that, um, as I've indicated, the two bodies have the same judicial head. That's always been the case since the Lands Tribunal for Scotland was set up in 1971 in the wake of the Conveyancing and Feudal Reform Scotland Act 1970. Um, or very shortly after that, at least, um, when Lord Bursey retired as chairman of the land court, the two posts were, were unified. So you have those two bodies which have separate jurisdictions, but they're joined at the top by having the same uh, judicial head. And it's always seemed to me, um, since I was first appointed, that it made a lot of sense uh, to unify them, you know, to complete what has been started, if you like, by unifying them. Um, and what I said to the Scottish government when I made the proposal that they should be unified was, if you're not with me on that, if you decide they shouldn't be unified, then please separate them altogether, because that will lead to greater coherence and distinction between them. Um, but I'm pleased, of course, they haven't gone down that route. So to answer your question, what are the advantages um, of unification? I use three words to um, describe those advantages. Simplicity, it's just easier if you have one body dealing with land issues rather than two. Uh, coherence, at the moment, um, there's a great deal of incoherence in the statutory provisions. Statutory provisions were drafted really without realizing, it seems to me, that the two bodies had the same judicial head. Um, so you have uh, some situations where the two bodies are involved in the same uh, process. Um, uh, and you have uh, one particular situation in the tenant farm right to buy under the Agricultural Holding Scotland Act 2003, where the Lands Tribunal, should it come across a question to do with agricultural land, which the lands, land court could decide, uh, may refer that to the land court. Now, it's a rather absurd thing for me to be referring um, uh, a question to myself in a different capacity. So that's that's where the greater coherence will come in. Uh, and the flexibility comes in in the ability to deploy both members of the court and tribunal and the staff of the court and the tribunal uh, right across both jurisdictions. I mean, at the moment, I'm the only shared asset. The deputy chairman of the land court can't sit on lands tribunal cases the deputy president is not actually called that, but in fact he is, Ralph Smith QC, can sit on um, land court cases uh, without special consent at least, um, and, and similarly, uh, although to a lesser extent, with members. And there are cases, there are cases where, let's say, land court cases. We had one recently with um, the Stornoway Wind Farm case, where um, it was very beneficial to be able to have um, 
uh, surveyor sitting uh, on the bench. Uh, so we did um, take someone from the Lands Tribunal, but he could only sit as an assessor since he's not a member of the Land Court. So that's not the same as being a full collegiate uh, member of the court. So it gives great flexibility. Um, and of course, if you have two staffs um, of similar size, the I think this will surprise uh, people how small the size of uh, our staff is on, on both sides of my, my jurisdiction. Um, the Land Court has a staff of four, the Lands Tribunal a staff uh, of three. You have them sitting uh, literally side by side here on the third floor of George House. You have the members uh, in adjacent uh, offices. Um, uh, and it just makes so much sense in terms of efficiency, people being able to cover for each other, deploying the appropriate expertise according to the needs of the case. Um, something to my mind which uh, has obvious advantages. Uh, so, so there we are. That, that's how I summarise it. Simplicity, coherence and flexibility. Well, I think those, those um, benefits sound ones very much worth pursuing because everyone's, everyone is certainly, especially in these difficult times, looking for simplicity of that, there's no doubt. Um, how have you found things since the lockdown period and in, in the business within the, the court and the tribunal? Well, I would divide it into three stages. Of course, the lockdown came suddenly and it paralyzed absolutely everything. So hearings of any sort were off at that point. We were fortunate on the Lands Tribunal side of things, I was fortunate at least in, in having plenty of work which could be done uh, on the basis of written submissions, particularly those um, cases under the Electronic Telecommunications Code. Um, and um, number of, in a number of those, the parties agreed that uh, we could decide cases on written submissions. Uh, so uh, that kept us um, you know, bu busy enough um, for a few months. Um, and then, of course, uh, the SCTS developed a system whereby cases could be heard on WebEx. Uh, so we got ourselves up to speed with those. Uh, and we began conducting WebEx cases. So that's the second phase. And we're now in the third phase where there's uh, a gradual return uh, to um, in-person hearings. Um, it seems very likely that WebEx will continue to be with us, and, and rightly so, um, in, for some kinds of cases. Uh, it, it produces a huge saving of time and expense uh, and so on. Uh, but it's, it's not the right medium for every case. So at the moment, we're doing a mixture. Um, the Lands Tribunal has uh, just been hearing a quite complex case, compensation case arising out of the Aberdeen West Relief uh, Road, and that's being done in person. So uh, that's just about over the line now. That's the first um, in-person hearing, I think I'm right in say, saying, for, since the lockdown began. Uh, and the Land Court is uh, out and about again. Um, uh, it's been up to Shetland. Um, a team is going up again next week following week, I go to the island of Harris. So that's us uh, out uh, literally in the field again. But going forward, it'll be a case-by-case -case analysis, as it you know, will be for, for all courts. Um, in some of our cases, of course, because they deal with land, you have to go and see the land. So, you know, the decision is made for you. But there are other cases where, where you don't. Um, and, and then it becomes a question of the nature of the case, uh, are there issues of credibility, in which case you prefer to see the whites of their eyes, so to speak. <laughs> um, but if there are not, if it's a legal debate, it can probably quite uh, properly be done uh, on WebEx and certainly procedural hearings will be will be on WebEx. So it, it'll be a, a blended system, I think, is the phrase used uh, going forward. And, you know, and, and that's good. And, and, and also the blend, the availability uh, of options to work from home or work um, from the office, so to speak, is something I think uh, most of our members enjoy, and uh, and I enjoy myself. Yeah. Uh, but, but nothing beats being, if you're a land court, nothing beats being back in the field. Well, I think the the, the the description of being out in the field and looking at these issues as they are, it sounds fabulous, I have to say. And I think, you know, obviously the hybrid system is with us and there are benefits to flow from technology, but there's nothing quite like getting out there and seeing the reality, especially of a dispute of this type. 
Yeah, I've always said, Alistair, that um, it's the best job in the law in Scotland. I was of that opinion long before I uh, thought there was going to be any possibility of uh, ending up uh, being on the land court. I used to tell Lord Philip uh, every time I saw him, um, <laughs> uh, he had the best job in Scotland when he was uh, in the chair. Uh, and um, I, I, I'm, I'm privileged to, to have held it and, and to hold it still. Uh, and I, I see this proposal of unification as, um, you know, giving the land court a whole new lease of life uh, and also just more generally and more, you know, more, more relevantly. You know, it's really all about court users at the end of the day, providing a better unified service to land law litigants in Scotland. Yeah. Well, that all sounds absolutely fantastic. I think it's brilliant that you're enjoying the, the role that you have because, especially in lockdown, I think everyone's reconsidered what they spend their time doing and what, I suppose, almost life is all about and work takes up so much time. So to be involved in, uh, uh, you know, the type of work that you thoroughly enjoy is, is fantastic. That's a great privilege. Yeah, it's fantastic. Now, um Thank you so much for that outline. That's brilliant. I'm sure our viewers will, will gain a great deal from it. So thank you. I, I, I have flagged this up in advance, but uh, when we're lucky enough to have esteemed guests such as yourself uh, uh, with us on Hey Legal, we always look where we can to ask some additional questions, and I hope that is okay sure. with you. Of uh, one of, Thank you. One of which is, uh, what is your favourite quote? Yes. Um, my taste in quotes is for the more splenetic uh, variety and my all-time favorite it's, it's, a, it's an easy question to 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 answer um, but um i, I was <laughs> really struck by the humor and effect of this one it's a quote from um senator uh, john randolph um who was a senator in the states in back in the 1980 sorry the 1820s 1820s uh, and he said of uh, his political opponent, um, Congressman Henry Clay, he is like a mackerel in the moonlight. He both shines and stinks. Uh, and it's used <laughs> to describe somebody who is outwardly brilliant, but rotten at the core. Uh, I've never met in life, fortunately, anyone of whom I think it, that, would be, that would be true. So I've never used it myself. Uh, but I think Randolph was was so pleased with it that he used it more than once against more than one opponent. Um, because when I was uh, checking as to to, to who um, it had been said about, um, uh, there are a couple of candidates for that. But a mackerel uh, in the moonlight because he both shines and stinks. I also like uh, Alfred Lord Tennyson in similar vein. He said, I think of Byron, but I could be wrong about that that he was a louse in the locks of literature. <laughs> Fantastic. And, and how did you discover the, the, the first quote in particular? Is, are, you a, are you a keen historian? Or no, 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 I, I'm, I'm not. Um, and frankly, uh, I, I can't remember. Uh, it may well have been just thumbing through a dictionary of quotations. I remember having one of those uh, as a lad, really. Um, but... Wherever it came from, it has stuck with me down through the years. Yeah, fantastic. Oh, fantastic. And hopefully you don't come across the, the character that you think it's applicable to. Uh, but a fantastic uh, couple of quotes here for us. Thank you. Um, another thing that we're involved in is an initiative around launching legal careers in Scotland. So we have a lot of students who consume our content and learn a lot about the prospect of, of a career in the law. Um, so what advice would you give to lawyers or, or students just starting out in their careers? Well, when I first decided to do law myself, to study law at university, I mean, um, I wasn't entirely sure that I wanted to be a, a lawyer. Um, and, and I also had a, a wobble even after I'd um, graduated um, and begun an, uh, an apprenticeship. Um, I... Um, broke it off, um, not a very sensible um, or considerate thing to do, uh, but I went off to uh, work for the BBC for a couple of years, a couple of very, very happy, carefree years. Um, but I found myself after a time um, 
hankering after the law, asking myself, okay, you've learned this stuff at university, you know, your mind operates in a different way now, possibly. Uh, are you never going to use it again? Um, so rather to my surprise, the law sort of called me back. And since then, I've never, ever wavered. Uh, and I've had a very happy career in the law. So my advice would be, um, if you think it's for you, go for it. Um, the world is your oyster now very much um, so compared to, to my day. I graduated in 1975. It was unusual, not unknown, but unusual at that time uh, for Scottish graduates to, to go um, anywhere out of Scotland, basically. A friend of mine went to work in the city of London and, and did very well there, but that was pretty exceptional. Um, whereas now, it's not just London, New York, Europe, wherever, you know. Um, you know, and it's not all just high corporate level stuff as well. You have lawyers working for charities and good causes and political parties and whatnot. So, the, you know, the range is very, very wide. Uh, so go for it and and find your niche in, in, in a, a range which is as wide uh, as being a um, solicitor doing, or an advocate doing crofting work uh, to somebody, an attorney doing... Um, corporate work in New York or something of that sort. So there's a lot in between. Yeah. Very wise advice. I mean, there is clearly, there are so many routes and opportunities that people yeah. can pursue within the law. They're in, almost, sure. in, they're all underpinned clearly by, you know, being part of the profession, but, but there are such dramatically different roles and opportunities available. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, so, um, Anyone who's interested in the law should be able to find a, a niche there, and it can be a very rewarding career. Um, no point, of course, in, in playing down um, the fact that, you know, it's, it's pretty competitive in most of those areas, pretty competitive. Uh, and it can be hard to make a living. And, 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 you know, let's be honest, lots of lawyers are finding it hard to make a living uh, at the moment. These are not easy times. But um, if you feel the law is calling you, um, if you feel that's where your natural aptitude lies, uh, you should pursue that. Yeah, absolutely. And was it, can I ask, did you, with the BBC, were you, were you considering pursuing a career in was it journalism or production or what was it? I had at one time considered a career in journalism um, um, when I was still at school uh, before the law had been suggested to me as a possibility. Um, it, it, it wasn't so much that, um, but that the uh, life of a, a researcher, which is what I became um, uh, in the BBC's Gaelic department in Glasgow, um, uh, seemed just <laughs> a lot more enjoyable uh, traveling the Highlands and Islands. And it was really in that role that I got my first sort of working knowledge of the Highlands and Islands beyond my own native Isle of Skye and, and some experience of Harris, which is where my parents came from. Right. Uh, uh, so um, I, I had two very enjoyable years um, and then a sort, you know, the real world came calling when um, I was sent down to London um, to work on the whole nationwide program and what was called an attachment. It was just a very short attachment and, you know, possibly had it been longer, I would have settled better there. But, but that, that um, as well as the feeling the, the sense that um, I should make something of what I'd learned at university that I possibly should go back to um, to the law. Um, forced with a, I wasn't forced with a choice, but the realization that, you know, a career in the BBC may take you elsewhere. Um, I, I thought, well, I, it wasn't a matter of retreating to my comfort zone, I, I hope, but it was a, a decision that I, I really, um, should uh, pursue that which had been my, you know, my first intention when I, when I yeah. um, decided to study law. When I started studying law in Edinburgh in 1971, my intention had been to go back to practice law as a solicitor in Sky uh, as soon as I could, as soon as I qualified. But um, <laughs> life so. takes over and lots of things happen. Uh, but I'm, that would, I think, have been a very enjoyable career as well. And um, I admire those who devote their careers to the service of small communities, they are very, very admirable. Um, but I am very pleased with where my career has, has brought me. Yeah. Very 
Well, given the fact that you described yourself as doing the best job in the law in, in Scotland, then uh, absolutely it has worked out that you, you came yeah. back to the law after that brief hiatus. So fantastic. So my final question for you, Lord Mingus, if you have time, please, is what questions should we have asked you? <laughs> uh, well, uh, you know, you've given me a pretty easy ride, so to speak, uh, on the <laughs> question of the uni unification of the court and the tribunal. Not not everyone is in favour, um, although I'm pleased to say that those most intimately um, affected by it by it are. Um, but uh, you know, it wasn't uh, when the government consulted on this uh, last year. The um, responses weren't unanimous. You wouldn't expect them to be. Um, but I've tried, um, it, you know, in this interview uh, and and in other um, things I've done uh, since the announcement was made by the government to reassure people that um, there really is no downside to this proposal. It won't lead to any diminution or, or dilution of the expertise being brought to bear on cases. The appropriate expertise will be brought to bear on the same uh, on each case. So I don't think there are any questions that you should have asked me, but you have given me the opportunity of explaining the proposal, and I'm very, very grateful. Well, I, I, I'm I absolutely indebted to you for taking the time to do so. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll look forward to publishing this, and we will provide relevant links to the different bodies that you're involved in, and uh, I have no doubt our viewers will be um, uh, fully engaged with everything that you've uh, outlined today. So thank you very much for that. Thank you very much, Alistair. It's been a pleasure. Pleasure too. Thank you so much.